Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to PC213, the course on the end times. Glad that all of us are able to connect and join the class today. I'd like to request somebody to lead us in prayer this morning, and then we will get started. Could somebody please unmute your mic and just pray with us as a class? Uh, okay, let's pray. Uh, right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this beautiful day, Father God. We praise you, Master. We worship you, God. Father God, we pray for this time, Lord Jesus, as we uh, dig into this season, Father God. We submit as his pastor into your mighty hand, Father God. Give him a more revelation, Lord, wisdom and the knowledge to teach us, Father God. And Father God, we pray for all the students, Father God, as we are, Lord, just learning from here, Lord Jesus. Give us more grace and favor to understand, Father God. We praise you, Master. We worship you. We give you all the glory and honor to you, Lord Jesus. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Good morning once again. Welcome. Um, so I've uh, shared some PDFs uh, in the coursework section. Uh, we have um, I've also uh, uploaded the PDF for the next lecture, uh, which we will hopefully get to today, uh, depending on the progress we make. Um, we've also uh, uploaded two reference books. Uh, one is um, the one by Dwight Pentecost. Uh, it's in a standard textbook on eschatology. Uh, and the other one was um, a book on the chronology of end time events. Uh, both these have been written by people from Dallas Theological Seminary. So it's pretty academic in nature. Uh, now, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary is a typical Baptist type, Baptist evangelical type theological seminary, one of the world's leading seminaries. Uh, the uh, the book, The Last Thing, so the, uh, by Dwight Pentecost was written back in 1958, and then it's been used as a standard textbook in many seminaries. Um, and uh, the, the main professor there was John Wilward, and then there was Dwight Pentecost, and then there was you know, Ben Rhodes or some, um, the one who wrote the other book. So they kind of, you know, um, they've learned from each other and built their understanding. Um, there are many, many books, many authors, like I mentioned last class. Uh, obviously, we cannot read all of them and so on. Uh, but over the years, I have read many, some quite a few books. And, and so what I'm sharing in the class notes is like a very clear, concise, easy to understand summary of uh, a study of the end times. But if you're interested, you could read these reference books. Uh, they're kind of big, but you know, you could just go to them whenever you want to understand something. Uh, and, uh, but what we're doing in the class is you know, a summary of what we've drawn from many sources. And of course, through a lot of study in the word of God itself, um, we will be sharing, but the reference books are there. You will not be asked any questions about the reference books. They're just there as a reference for you to use if you're interested. Uh, you will not be tested on that, you know, so it's, uh, so don't worry about it. The test will be based on uh, what we are learning in class and uh, you could use the class notes and that will uh, be more than enough, okay? But if you're interested, the books are there. Um, so let's pick up from where we paused last week as we uh, just kind of did an introduction to um, the whole course uh, and said, you know, this is, how, this is the approach we are going to take in terms of studying the end times. So that's what we did in the introduction chapter. So let me just uh, go ahead and share PDFs. All right, so we covered this is um, yeah so we just you know went through the introduction last week uh, just to quickly review we we um, went through reasons why we should be spending time studying on the end times 
Um, then we talked about our approach in studying on the end times. Uh, and uh, we did mention that there are different uh, positions as far as um, pe what people take as far as the interpretation of the timeline on the end times. And that is fine. We are respectful of each other. But the position that we are taking is what is commonly referred to as um, dispens dispensational pre-millennialism. So that's our position. That's where we will be coming from. And that's typically the position of many evangelicals, including you know, the professors from Dallas Theological Seminary and so on, typical positioning. Uh, but there are others who would look at things differently, and that's fine. Um, so we went through the, you know, our approach to studying the scriptures, and we ended here that you know, there are some things we do not subscribe to, uh, and we will stay away from uh, you know, discussing those kinds of topics. So uh, we're going to get into uh, the second lecture now, uh, where I want to quickly uh, reiterate, reaffirm uh, the fact that the scriptures, the Bible, is a solid prophetic book. Now, you have seen some of this already when we did our course, I think on uh, hermeneutics or in apologetics. In one of these courses, we, we did reaffirm this or we talked about this. Um, but I'm just you know saying that again here as a way of reminder that um, the Bible is the most reliable text as far as prophecies are concerned, which is foretelling of events are concerned. Um, it stands out in, in, in a very indisputable way, uh, in, in, in a very remarkable way. And uh, we can, you know, list out um, uh, several prophecies of scripture, which we will do, we'll do a few of them, uh, which, you know, when we look at the probability of those prophecies being fulfilled, it was almost impossible. And yet we see that those prophecies, prophecies were fulfilled. And therefore, as we begin to study um, the end times, uh, we do so with much confidence that what we are reading, uh, what the Bible has, is speaking about or foretelling about the end times and things to come is absolutely reliable the only challenge is for us to understand and interpret those things uh, correctly, which we are going to try to do the best we can in this course. Now, two familiar passages for all of us uh, as we study scripture is that the, the scriptures were given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the prophets who prophesied, um, the Holy Spirit who was in them was indicating or he was letting them know things in advance. And they were foretelling these things through the help of the Holy Spirit. Right? And you uh, see this affirmed for us here in Scripture. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So both in First Peter chapter one verse ten through twelve, and Second Peter chapter one verse twenty to twenty one, we see that Scripture was not given by some man's idea. They were not somebody sitting and writing up things, but prophets, men of God, holy men of God. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in them was revealing these things to them, and they would write these things for us. So. The scriptures are inspired, and and you know we could look at uh, many many prophecies. You know, somebody's counted. Euros has counted about two thousand five hundred prophecies, ap approximately, uh, in the Bible, and uh, you know ten thousand three hundred eighty-five verses predicting the Lord's return. So, in a sense, there are numerous prophecies in the Bible, uh, which we can see having been fulfilled. Some of the, just to list some of these out for our, you know, reminder, and we've seen all of this before, um, you know, we could think about the Egyptian slavery, how uh, God spoke to Abraham, and he said, you know, your descendants are going to be slaves, and they're going to be there for 400 years. 
you know, sure enough, that's exactly what happened. You know, um, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, sons of Jacob, Joseph, was taken into Egypt. And thereafter they were in, they were there for 400 years until God raised up Moses to bring them out. So that prophecy was fulfilled. Babylonian captivity, the prophets Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, and Isaiah were prophesying about this, the judgment or you know what was going to happen. And uh, they spoke very specifically. Right? Jeremiah said, look, you're going to serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Very specific. King of Babylon, 70 years. You know, um, 70 years, you're going to be there. You're going to be in exile. Sure enough, that's exactly, exactly what happened. Nebuchadnezzar came in uh, around, around 530 BC or something, around that, uh, in the 6th century BC. He came in, invaded Babylon, took a lot of the Jews into captivity, into exile, into Babylon. And we know the story of, you know, Daniel and others who were there. And they're there for 70 years. Now, the Babylonian Empire collapsed. The Medes came into power. The Medes, they were short-lived. They were overthrown by the Persians. The Persians came into power. And then the Persian king announces, okay, all of you people, Jews, go back to Jerusalem. But from Nebuchadnezzar to the first Persian king, King Cyrus, it was a period of 70 years, you know. And people, the Jewish people were there uh, in that area. And then they returned back to uh, Babylon. So again, fulfilled exactly 70 years. Um, yeah, King Cyrus of Persia, Isaiah prophesied and called him by name. You know, that's an amazing thing that Isaiah would prophesy about 150 years, even before he was born, he would say that there's a, who is Cyrus? He's going to do what my pleasure is. And he's going to say to Jerusalem, you will be built and that to the temple, your foundation will be laid. So can you imagine Isaiah's prophesying? He's saying somebody called Cyrus is going to say, Jerusalem will be built the temple foundation will be laid. As I had no clue that this man he was calling by name, and he mentions him twice, uh, you know, was actually going to be the king of Persia who's, who's, who would be doing this, you know. And, uh, but that's how amazing it is, the prophecy. Um, he called him by name and he said what he's going to decree. And sure enough, we read in Ezra, the Cyrus king of Persia, in the first year that he comes into power, he makes a proclamation uh, and he puts it in writing. He says, you know, all of you, you go and build the house of God at Jerusalem. So he's, you know, he's essentially doing what Isaiah had prophesied 150 years earlier. So go and build the temple of Jerusalem. No, he does that in his first year as king. So, you know, the probability of something like this being fulfilled mathematically was, you know, was calculated by uh, Professor Heros, one in 10 to the power of 15. It's, it's just almost unimaginable, but yet it was fulfilled. Um, Daniel prophesies um, in Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 25-26. And uh, now, this prophecy of Daniel, of course, has to do with the end times. And uh, it's the angel who comes and uh, interprets it for him, I mean, reveals it to him. So Daniel speaks about 70 weeks, uh, which has to do with his people. That means it has to do with um, the Jewish people. But um, he says, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, that is, this is the command that was issued by King Cyrus. Now remember, Daniel was receiving this revelation 
even before King Cyrus had come into power. So Daniel was a prophet in three empires. He started off in the empire, the Babylonian empire with King Nebuchadnezzar. Then he served in uh, under, so he served under Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, the Babylonian kings. Then he served under Darius, the Mede. And he came up till the point when Cyrus came into power, the Persian king. But at that time, Cyrus said, all of you go back. But Daniel 9 is happening somewhere when he's under uh, Darius, the king of, of the Medes, small, you know, they, they were short-lived. And he's getting a revelation that from the going forth of the command to build Jerusalem, that means it's go, it, was going to have, it, it would happen shortly. Until Messiah, the prince, so Daniel is having receiving a revelation about the Messiah, you know. So this is actually happening almost 500 years, almost 500 years before time that there is going to be the Messiah, the prince. And he's saying from this time to, from the time King Cyrus issues the decree to go and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there's going to be seven and 62. That's a total of 69 weeks. And each week represents uh, seven years. So it's a total of 483 years. So what Daniel is receiving a revelation is it's 483 years, almost 500 years from the time of King Cyrus till the Messiah, right? And he's saying the Messiah will be cut off. That means Messiah is going to be crucified or he's going to die, he's going to die, right? So it's all really amazing that, uh, you know, uh, from the there's 483 years, the ministry of Jesus began and, uh, and he was, you know, subsequently crucified. So it's amazing. The Daniel, almost 500 years before, almost 500 years, is getting a revelation that there's going to be the command to go rebuild Jerusalem. There's going to be 483 years later, the Messiah, the prince is going to come and he's going to be killed and, and so on. Right? So again, this was fulfilled. And uh, it's just an amazing prophecy. Again, the probability is, you know, one in 10 to the power of five. Somebody could calculate, I mean, again, euros calculated. Like this, there are several prophecies concerning Jesus himself, you know, that he would be born of a woman, the seed of the woman, come to the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of the tribe of Judah, that he would be born in Bethlehem. And uh, this is, again, an amazing prophecy. Micah prophesies. Uh, prophesied about 700 BC that Jesus would come forth out of Bethlehem. He would be born of a virgin. He would, he would grow up. He would be in Egypt for some time. He would be called. He would be called a Nazarene. He would be betrayed by his close friends. He'd be sold for 30 pieces of silver. He would be crucified. Not one of his bones would be broken. People would cast lost lots for his clothes, and he would live again. So. These are just some of the prophecy. There are many more, but some of the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ himself, which all of them were fulfilled. It's really amazing. And then, you know, Jesus himself foretold the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem 40 years before. And then in AD 70, sure enough, the Roman general Titus came in and destroyed the temple uh, at Jerusalem. That was the, 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 uh, the rebuilt temple. So Solomon's temple that was rebuilt, rebuilt by uh, uh, Zerubbabel was then subsequently um, uh, destroyed. The dispersion, the regathering of Israel that, that was spoken of right from the very beginning, right? From the times of Moses, other prophets, they, they spoke about the fact that the Jewish people will be dispersed among the nations and that they would be regathered and they would be reestablished as a nation. And so this was, you know, 3,500 years of history eventually fulfilled 
in the establishing of Israel as a nation. So the, these are just some of the prophecies. And the reason we just went through this is to show us that, look, the Bible is extremely reliable when it comes to prophetic text. Some of it may seem really, really difficult for it to be fulfilled. But going by all the prophecies we've seen, so many of them have already been fulfilled, the way they have been spoken. As we look at prophetic scripture about things to come, we can be absolutely certain that everything that has been foretold will be fulfilled. We can have that confidence as we look into the prophetic scriptures, that the that Bible prophecy is accurate and reliable. Now, uh, I'm just going to change a little focus now. And uh, I want us to think about some of the terminology being used in the scriptures concerning the end times. Uh, we are going to read uh, Matthew 24, the whole chapter. Uh, we're going to do that in a, in a little bit. But I want uh, us to keep in mind that try to list down uh, different terminology on the end times here. Yeah. I just kind of did a search in scripture and listed out. So there's various terminology of phrases like the last days, the time of the end. And I've given you the references. So if you would like to, you know, be in your own time, look at all of those scriptures, very interesting the latter days, uh, we'll look at all of them and I'll come back and make some comments. The day of the Lord, the day of wrath, last day, singular, end of the age, ends of the ages, end of the ages. And all of these is taken from the New King James Version. The last hour, the coming of the Lord, the appearing, the revelation of Jesus Christ, when he appears, his coming, or the coming of the Son of Man. Right? So like this. Um, what I do want to say is this, that these terms, uh, when we look at Scripture, we find that these terms are used in different contexts. So depending in, on, on the context in which it is used, we must understand what time frame or what it is actually referring to. For example, and we can think of many examples, Peter stands up and says, you know, this is an Acts chapter two, he says, and he's quoting from Joel, he says, you know, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And this is in Acts chapter 2. And he says, you know, what you're seeing on the day of Pentecost, he says, this is the fulfillment of what Joel said. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit. So that means the last days in that context began on the day of Pentecost. Because Peter is saying, hey, this is what God said. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So, as far as the and thus is on the Pentecost is going on, but as you will see in Matthew twenty-four, 
you'll find other terminology being used very specifically of the days preceding the tribulation. So, so you know, the disciples ask Jesus, you know, what's the sign of the coming? What are the sign of these? When will these things be fulfilled? And then he gives us signs. There he's speaking very specifically of the period just before the tribulation. And then he transitions into speaking very specifically about the tribulation itself and how that will come to a close. But there, the terminology is, the you understand it from the context and how it is being used. It's talking about that time period. Then you'll find the word last days are also being used to refer to the coming of Jesus to set up his kingdom, just the, big, the start of the millennium. The word last day is also used there. Or Peter would use it as the end of the tribulation just before the great white throne judgment. That's also referred to as the last day. Right. So what I'm saying is, Acts 2, last days, last day referred to Christ coming to establish his kingdom before the millennium, last day also used in the context of the great wine throne judgment. It's all, you know, it's being used the same way, but depending on the context, you should, we should understand what is being referred to. I know this is a little difficult for us, um, and it's not easy. Even now when I'm reading this, it's okay, you know, what is he talking about exactly? Then you have to look at the context. You have to understand. And then you also have to keep in mind that sometimes in one sentence, two different time frames are being referenced. You know, so it is in one statement, but he's talking about Jesus coming and establishing his kingdom. And then he's talking about the great white throne judgment. And between these two, there's a thousand year period, as we will see in Revelation chapter 20 and verse four. So both are being referenced as the last day in almost one same sentence, but there's a thousand year gap in between. So we will have to understand it. So to be able to interpret that, we should have an understanding of the prophetic timeline which we will pick up uh, a little later from the book of Revelation. Okay, so uh, just we, you know, over time we will become familiar with the terminology on the end times, and also develop the skill of being able to understand, based on the context, what what is he referring to in the timeline, the prophetic timeline, and to establish a prophetic timeline. We will pick that up from the book of Revelation, right? We will come to that in a subsequent chapter. But now let's just go to Matthew, the 24th chapter, and just read, you know, what Jesus takes us through an overview of the end times. And th there are parallel passages, Matthew 24 and Luke 21. I will just read Matthew 24, the entire chapter. Now, before we start reading, I want to see if there are any questions in the, uh, from the class. Let's turn to Matthew 24, and then let's take up some, see if there are any questions. All right. Elisha, Elisha, you're back. Oh, my internet connect well is praying, sorry. Okay, hope Elisha's back. All right, next. Is, okay. are the same person um, uh, but I will I will just have to um, let me let's just look let me look up the book of Esther one minute I'm trying to so Sri Kumar's question is King Cyrus you know sometimes we don't just I can't remember this is three names of hand uh, King Cyrus. 
Mm. Let me just look up. Sorry, Shrikama, sometimes I don't remember these names correctly. No, Sorry, no, just... no issues. Thank you. Um, let me look up Ezra. So, Sri Kumar's question is, is King Cyrus and King Xerxes the same? I just want to look it up in Ezra. And yeah, King's brother Cyrus. Cyrus, King is called Cyrus here. And one minute, chapter four. Okay. So in my notes here in my Bible, thank God. Sometimes I write notes in the Bible, so that's good. It's very useful. So in my notes here in the Bible, I have uh, the sequence of the of the kings. So we have um, King Cyrus around 555 BC. Uh, so this is about the Persian Empire. Okay. So King Cyrus. Then after him came somebody called. Oh, wait a minute. Am I going the right way? Uh, this is Ezra 6. This is, well, basically, Xerxes was 486 to 464 BC. So he would come. So he's basically, uh, according to what I, my notes are here, according to my notes, uh, Xerxes and Cyrus were two different kings. Uh, Cyrus was around 555 to 529 BC, gave the decree to rebuild the temple. And Xerxes is also known as King Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. And he was there from 486 to 464 BC. So to answer your question, Thanks to these notes. <laughs> um, Xerxes is the same as King Hazus in the book of Esther, but he's different from Cyrus, the king who gave the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, so okay, I just want to know, is Cyrus, Cyrus reference is there in the Bible? Yes, his name is mentioned very clearly. Uh, like we said in Isaiah, the two verses yeah, that have. is there, but uh, and uh, also in Ezra. So, Ezra chapter one, uh, we have the name of King Cyrus uh, as he gives the decree for the people to go back and build Jerusalem. So, that's what I was looking for. Uh, so, in Ezra chapter one, King Cyrus is mentioned. Esther, Thank you. Yeah, Esther chapter one, this is King Ahasuerus. Yeah. And, that's the one who was also known as, who was also known as Xerxes. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, Devi, your question, please. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, my question is uh, about another terminology that we always hear. Uh, some people say the prophetic calendar of God. Um, so I was just trying to understand what do they mean by saying prophetic calendar. And I have one more question, Pastor. Can I ask? Uh, it yeah, might be under. It might be unrelated to this topic, but as I, as uh, you were mentioning regarding how 150 years before Cyrus was born, King Cyrus was born. This was prophesied and all that. Uh, uh, that made me think: How uh, is the sovereignty of God and the free will of man? Uh, working together. This might have been answered many times faster, but I was just trying to, still mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. difficult for me to comprehend. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay, going back. So your first question. So it's just language we use. When we say uh, the prophetic 
calendar or the prophetic timetable. Right? It's just language that we use to talk about uh, the sequence of the end time events. Now, like we see in Matthew 24, Jesus makes it very clear that nobody knows that uh, the hour or the day in which we, we will be reading. Uh, nobody knows you know, the day and the time in which these things will be fulfilled, especially the return of the Lord. Nobody knows except the Father. So although we are saying prophetic timeline, prophetic calendar, we only have an understanding of the sequence of events based on what we see in the scriptures, but we do not have date and time. Even though we use the word calendar or timeline, we actually don't have date and time. We only have a sequence, okay, uh, based on scripture. Okay, these, these things will happen like this. So we have to understand that uh, uh, what we are saying is, okay, this is what we understand to be the sequence of events, but we definitely do not ha have any understanding of date and time. We can only say the time is near or the time is nearer, uh, see all these things being fulfilled, it's getting closer. You know, we can say those kinds of things based on what's happening around us, the sign of, we will have, we will, we have a chapter on that. We will, we will list all the signs of the times, which is, so based on that, we will say like, you know, we're getting really close, you know, much closer than 30 years ago because of these reasons. But the day and time is only known to God. Is that okay? Did I answer your question? The first yes, question. Yes, yes, first. Okay. Thank you. Now the second question is this. And it is a very interesting thing, which actually the Apostle Paul deals with in depth in Romans chapter 10 and 11. And we will study Romans next year. But in Romans chapter 10 and 11, he really answers to this question about the foreknowledge of God and the free will of man. So in this case, in this particular example, we are talking about Isaiah prophesying 150 years before about Cyrus, King Cyrus. So God's foreknowledge expressed through the prophet. He called him by name and he said, this is what this man is going to do. He's going to announce the rebuilding of Jerusalem and rebuilding of the, and the man's name is Cyrus. So that's the foreknowledge of God. So Paul in his writing, in Romans 10 and 11, he is talking about, he's talking about several examples. Like for instance, he talks about Pharaoh, you know, uh, that God wanted to execute a purpose and he had Pharaoh in place. But we know from scripture that it was Pharaoh who hardened his heart, refusing to let the people go and therefore God demonstrated his power. So there was a foreknowledge of God, but there was also the response of man. So what would have happened, and the Bible doesn't tell us this, but what would have happened in the case of King Cyrus was that God would have stirred his heart. You know, because we know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. So Cyrus is a, you know, he's not a, a, a believe. He, he was not a believer in Yahweh God, but somehow he must have felt stirred in his heart to issue the decree. He may not have studied Bible. I mean, he may not, may not have even read Isaiah's prophecies. He may not have read Jeremiah's prophecies. Uh, but somehow he would have felt stirred in his heart. But, 
and uh, he had to do it. That means he had to issue the decree, which he did. Right? Does that mean Cyrus was a robot in the hands of God? In my understanding, I don't think so. I believe God moved upon Cyrus. That means he, you know, stirred him his heart, but Cyrus exercised his free will to issue the decree. Because when he issues the decree, you know, you can read that in Ezra chapter one. He says, I decree that, you know, you go back to Jerusalem, rebuild Jerusalem. So we can never take away the fact that uh, even in the moving of God, man has a free will involved in order to do what he feels moved to do, uh, moved by God to do. So for example, you know, if you look at the prophecies of Jesus, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, take the child, go into Egypt and be there for some time. Now Joseph had to get up and do it. He could have said, oh no, I'll just stay here. Uh, why should I go to Egypt? I don't want to go to Egypt. Now, did God speak to Joseph? Yes, but Joseph had to obey and he had to do it by his will. The good thing is he did it, but what if he chose to stay? We don't know what would happen. God would have had to have some other way to protect the baby, baby Jesus. But the instruction from God was get up, take the baby, go to Egypt, stay there until I tell you to protect the child because the king is going to seek to destroy all the children. So God spoke to Joseph, but Joseph had to, and in the process, he was actually fulfilling prophecy because the prophecy said, out of Egypt, I have called you. So when they came out of Egypt, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. And then when they came out of Egypt, they went and settled in Nazareth. So he was born in Bethlehem, lived, I mean, preserved in Egypt, but lived in Nazareth or grew, grew up in Nazareth, all three fulfilling Bible prophecy. But the free will of man was involved in fulfilling prophecy. So to answer your question, I said too much, but to answer your question, God speaks out of his foreknowledge, that's prophecy, but man, human agency is involved out of free will to fulfill that prophecy. Sometimes they know it, sometimes it's, uh, most of the time we don't know it, but we are moved by God, God speaks to us, God directs us, and we are actually fulfilling prophecy out of obedience to what God says. Uh, does that answer your question, Divya? Yes, yes, Master. thank you. Thank you for the detailed explanation. It's okay. wonderful, thank you. Yeah, okay. welcome. All right. So um, let's begin to read Matthew chapter 24. Uh, we will take uh, each one, we'll read uh, uh, two verses and um, maybe three verses each. Uh, whoever likes to read, uh, please unmute your mic and just read three verses. There are 51 verses. I want to read it very quickly and uh, just get a, get a sense of what Jesus told us about the end times. So let's start with verse one. Anybody please unmute your mic and read. Verse one. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he told them, do you see all these buildings? I assure you, they will be no, they will be so completely demolished that not one stone will be left on top of another. Okay, let's keep going quickly. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. 
For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For the nation will rise again against nation, and the kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, uh, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Okay, thank you. Let's just make, uh, let's pause here. Let's pause here. I want to just show you something. I want you to see something here, all right? So the disciples are asking Jesus, when is going to be the sign? What are the signs of your coming? At the end of the age. So obviously they're asking him about, he, he is there. But they're asking him about his coming, you know, to set up his kingdom and to wrap everything up. What is the sign? <coughs> Sorry. So from verse 4 to verse 14, Matthew 24, verse 4 to 14 is one section. These are the signs that are leading up to the tribulation. Or these are the beginning of sorrows. It's leading up to the tribulation. The tribulation is, is a time of great sorrow. But these are the beginning of sorrows. The time that is from verse 4 to 14 deals with global things happening. That means it deals with everybody. You know, um, all the things listed there. But from 15 onwards, it begins to deal specifically with the Jewish people. And you say, why? Because... When we study Daniel's prophecies, Daniel chapter 9, especially, there the 70 weeks of Daniel, that's that the angel spoke to Daniel about, are specific to the Jewish people. He says, this is concerning you, your people, and your people. And in Daniel's 70 weeks, seven years have been left. 69 weeks have already been fulfilled. 483 years have already been fulfilled. The seven years are pending, waiting to be fulfilled. So that's why you will hear about Daniel's 70th week. That means the last seven years have not been fulfilled. It's the 70th week, the last seven years. And that seven year period as we see in Daniel 9, is specific to the Jewish people, meaning the, the whole world is going to experience judgment and all of that, 
we see in the book of Revelation, but the prophecies that are given are specific to what affects the Jewish people. And that transition is happening in verse 15. Because Jesus is saying, when you see the abomination of desolation. So this is language Jesus is actually taking from the book of Daniel. It says, spoken by Daniel the prophet. So he's referring to the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation. From Daniel chapter 9. So this, this transition is happening in verse 15. All of the preceding signs are global. You know, he's saying, verse 9, you know, you're going to be hated for my name's sake. You know, that's believers in Jesus are going to be persecuted, global persecution of believers. Um, they will, people are going to hate one another, verse 10. There's that you know, increasing animosity just among people. Verse 11, false prophets will arise and deceive many. So that's, again, a global phenom phenomenon. Uh, verse 12, lawlessness will abound. People are going to be cold in their love. Global phenomena. Uh, verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom being preached to all the nations as a witness. Something that's happening all over the world. But verse 15 transitions into what Daniel prophesied specific to the Jewish people. Okay, keep that thought in mind. We'll go for a break, and if you have any questions, uh, we will pick it up at that time. Is that okay? So let's take a break, and we will get back in 10 minutes, and we'll continue reading Matthew 24 from verse 15 onwards, okay? Hope I didn't leave you in suspense. You're all okay? <laughs> all fine. Any questions you want to ask before going for the break? Okay. Um, let's take a break and be right back in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 